Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this um, video call on unpaid care work. I will be speaking in Spanish. And you can choose the language of your preference on the bottom right of the screen. So you can choose between English, Spanish, French, and Arabic. Thank you very much for joining us today. We will be I just want to make sure that you're listening to the English interpretation. Kate, could you please write in the chat box that you're listening to the English channel? Very well, you can all hear me. Let's wait just a couple of minutes to get more participants online because some of them were having technical difficulties. Meanwhile, let me tell you that today we'll have six presenters, seven presenters, who have a lot of experience in, on, in care work, in the ESCR topic. So as we move forward in the presentation, Very well, I think we can start. We have all of our speakers online and present. Okay, so let me greet everyone from the ESCR net. My name is Viviana Osorio. I'm the coordinator of the task force of women and ESCR. Um, we have about 300 members, including organizations, social movements of um, over 80 countries all over the world. And we look to, for a global movement for social justice. One of the initiatives of uh, women in ESCR, especially one of the, of the task force aims, is to give form to, to the work with the feminist view. That's why we've had some discussions that um, we had to prioritize. So the first discussion was on um, women and, and ESCR, especially women and uh, strikes. So in the last conversation, we talked about cooperative abuse and how it impacts uh, women. We also discussed the fact on the treatment in some companies that uh, is being discussed also at the UN. So today we'll talk about unpaid care work, social protection, and austerity measures. As you know, care work is done mostly by women. Three fourths of the um, care work is done by women and uh, girls all around the world. So we want to make um, this type of work with all the, the rights the workers have, and especially for women 
We want them to have a social security. So it's a very important issue regarding gender equality. As well as social protection systems have been structured from formal work schemes, formal work plans, and that has avoided women to be formally hired and so they are not able to access social security. We've also seen how austerity measures have increased and how they're being implemented by several governments and due to the pressure of international organizations, it has affected the right to social security as well as not having access to public services on uh, health care. So we need to redistribute this workload that has been developed by women. So those are the topics we'll be discussing today. We'll try to explore certain um, experiences of countries and how it has impacted. And it's a very important topic regarding the economic, social, and cultural rights on women and we will also discuss the DSCR standards that uh, should be careful with austerity measures. So to start our conversation, let me welcome the first speaker we have today. Her name is Ana Teresoiles. She's from Colombia, from the Na Escuela Nacional Sindical, which is a school that aims to promote equal work. She has worked with um, care work in Colombia, and she has helped implement um, a, ra a net of uh, health care providers in Colombia. So let's welcome her. But before, I would like to ask, how can we understand unpaid care work? Does that mean that care work is, is very important for life? So how does this impact women's reality around the world? And how acknowledging it, redistributing the care work is very important for the economic and social rights of women? So thank you. You have eight minutes for your presentation. I'll give you the floor. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this video conference. My name is Ana Teresa Vérez Orrego. I work in the National Union School in Colombia. However, my main job with the citizenship is to work with uh, women who do domestic work. We help them in the union, we help them in improving access to their rights as well. So this global care economy or this care economy is based on acknowledging care as work and as a right. These concepts are quite new, at least in Latin America. We are just starting to discuss them, to understand them, and to understand all the implications that it has for women because we are the main providers of this type of care work. So by care work, unpaid care work, we understand all of these actions where we care for someone's life in a domestic environment. Uh, be children, disabled people, elderly or, or sick, and these women don't, re don't receive any income. They also not only care for the 
for the person, but they are also, they also have to do house chores, for example, cooking, cleaning, getting wood for the fire, especially in the rural areas. So they sustain life in, in general around the world. So this is a work that has been recently recognized and acknowledged by the states and by society, but we're still working in making it, recognizing this type of work is recognizing other rights as well, because it is connected with all sorts of life. And I've been very interested uh, in reading experiences and literature uh, from other countries. So there's a lot of analysis and theories, but also many practices that want to entail changes. And also I have analyze the connection we have with other rights. You know that when we talk about care work, there's remunerated work and non-remunerated. With the remuneration work is basically domestic work. But also, many women uh, in the world are the ones in, in charge of doing this domestic work, and it has a lot of implications for access to rights. In Colombia, in Latin America, and in the world generally, care work has uh, certain implications for access to social security, for example. When the care work is not acknowledged as work, then those women cannot have access to participate in a public social system with social security. That right is only acknowledge if you have a formal or productive work. So if we take into account the, the rank of informal work, you can imagine the percentage of, uh, of, of the people not having access to it. We also have data regarding the population and how it's becoming um, it's growing up, so we not only need to take care of the elderly, but women who are getting older as well sometimes don't have a social security system that will protect them and look after them when they are older. So we don't have a public system who will take care of those who have taken care of throughout their whole lives of people. So that's an important issue to develop regarding protection, social, economic rights for women around the world. International organizations have worked with, uh, regarding this issue. And sometimes it has caused a setback because of the life expectation is going up. And so the legal implications that we have in expenses for our pension implies also the non-recognition of care work when it's women who do that work but who have never saved money or, or have had a contribution in pension. So this is also an important issue regarding recognition, distribution, and reducing the informal care work. We cannot allow the states to make decisions at a legal and political scope that would have direct implications on women, especially the economic and social development of these women. So we need further analysis on our place of work, on our place in society and what this sexual division implies in work. These are analyses that we need to do in a more comprehensive way.
Thank you, Ana Teresa, for this uh, thorough introduction to the topic. Indeed, when we talk about austerity measures, we need to take into account certain standards so that women's rights will not be affected and those uh, care workloads will not increase for women. I will now like to introduce you to Hector from Ocean. Hector is part of Section 27, a public interest organization that provides legal assistance for social justice and it's focused in giving access to care work and education in vulnerable communities. They have been uh, in charge of um, high impact litigation, uh, public policies, research and legal actions. So Hector, you have the floor and I would especially would like to invite you to tell us a bit about the relevance in putting in the center, putting at the core the topics of austerity regarding economic, social, and cultural rights, because this is a very important topic. And the second point from the work you do and the work your organization does in South Africa, I would like to ask you if you could share with us the impacts regarding ESCR in health care services and education services in South Africa once um, austerity measures have been implemented by the government. So I'll give you the floor. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I work at a legal NGO, Section 27. Um, we, our focus is on access to health care and education. Um, so we've been involved in policy development and litigation against the state um, for improved access. And one of the issues that keeps coming up is fiscal constraints. And this is caused by austerity measures being implemented by the government. Um, in the past four years, there's actually been a decline in spending per person in real terms in both the health and education and the social security sector. And obviously that has the worst impact on women. Um, so, the consequences we found is that there's critical staff shortages in healthcare, and that's impacting on access to health. Um, there's lack of medicines. The, the budget for infrastructure at schools have been cut. Um, we're involved in cases where learners have drowned in pit latrines because there's no in proper infrastructure and sanitation provided at schools in rural provinces. So what we've been trying to do in our work is trying to bring in more budget submissions in our litigation in particular um, to show that, to analyze the planning documents and the budgeting documents and to make submissions to Treasury directly on their budgeting processes and to advocate for more social um, spending. So there's been um, austerity measures in cuts in social spending and also in regressive tax measures. So there's been an increase in our value added tax and um, that obviously that impacts the poor the most. So in our litigation, um, as part of our court papers, we've actually been submitting um, budget analysis of court of, um, of government budgets. And what we found is that a lot of the budgets show fruitless and wasteful expenditure and just a lack of planning. So even though provincial budgets might be increasing, they're not using it the budgets effectively um, to plan for social spending, um, particularly in health and, and for education for learners with disabilities. We've included this in our litigation papers around these issues. Um, it's also shown that budgets are not being um, spent for the intended purpose. So where national government ring fences budgets for a specific um, purpose, it's not being used for what it's intended for and it's being deviated to other to other. Um, categories, specifically um, human resource constraints, um, human resource issues. So we've, um, in addition to making submissions through litigation efforts, we make submissions to Treasury and to the, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights on issues um, specifically to, to negate the impact of austerity. 
So some of the submissions we made is that instead of implementing austerity measures, which um, has devastating consequences on social security and um, economic, social and cultural rights, there should be more sustained um, measures put in place to deal with debt crisis because austerity has been has been implemented as a response to our debt situation. We also recommended that a human rights impact assessment be um, included into the budgeting process and that more consultation be had with grassroots organizations. And we've been doing capacity building for um, grassroots organizations to participate in the budgeting process. Um, we also advocate for more efforts against corruption. Um, there's been widespread corruption at our state owned enterprises in particular. Um, so recently there's been a commission of inquiry into state capture um, and corruption into our, our government for, um, institutions. So we've made detailed submissions on all the incidents of irregular tenders that has been brought to our attention to this commission. And we've also argued for a more sustained approach to, to human resource strategy and human resource planning that isn't just responsive to wage um, negotiations. Um, so we're still, this is a new area that we're, we're exploring to negate the impacts of austerity. Um, and we have a treasury that's that's willing to engage with us at this stage. Um, so hopefully we'll have some positive results soon. Thank you. Gracias, Ekta, por compartirnos el caso de Sudáfrica. Thank you, Ekta, for sharing South Africa's experience. We know that when we have uh, cuts in care work, social work, for example, people with disabilities, or even in education, it has very important impacts and effects on women and on their care workload. So thank you for sharing the, uh, your experience. And now I would like to invite Chris Mendoza. Chris specializes in gender issues. She has worked in strengthening organized women's groups uh, in communities, indigenous women, workers, civil society organizations. And she has helped to implement processes of care work in Mexico City and at a national level in Mexico. She also participates in the Care Work Network, and she's now uh, an advisor. So welcome, Chris. And I would like to ask you today why access to social security and public care services is important for people who do unpaid care work and women in general. And I would also like to ask you if you could share with us Mexico's experience. We know that there has been um, budgetary cuts because of austerity measures. So my question is, how have these austerity measures have impacted the care work plan in the country? So you have the floor. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you and discussing these types of issues all around the world. Um, in Mexico is um, morning, so good morning, everyone. And to keep analyzing this discussion, I would like to start how uh, social security access and care, health care access are basic in order to stop inequality in our countries and specifically Mexico. So as we mentioned, in our societies, women are the ones who carry out the care work in our domestic work, women and girls. So here I would like to reflect on how these cultural traditions have been feminized on one hand. And when we talk about this feminized work is because we have reflected that due to gender roles and the work division, women and girls were always in households, so they are the ones who do those um, chores. The families are also responsible of, um, of taking care of uh, 
of these people, so they try to to not make the government responsible. So when we say that care work is uh, feminized, we are engaging with uh, inequality because the families depend on their own resources, so depending on how much money they have is the quality uh, of care work they will have. So uh, poor families will have less resources and less access or less elements to cover these care needs. So poor families will have more uh, poor care, health care work than rich families. That's why through social security and public care work can be key in order to, to stop this practice. There's also inequality in uh, gender regarding care work. As we have mentioned before, there's a uh, overload on women and it affects on the time they have in order to exercise other types of rights. For example, the right to education, the right to work. So time availability is a crucial factor to be able to have access to these activities and to conclude, to finish some studies or to be able to be hired in a formal and remunerated work with social security. So on one hand, due to this workload, women have more difficulties to enter their remunerated formal work and even more to have formal work with Social Security. So as a consequence, as it was mentioned uh, by one of the previous speakers, women have less possibilities to have a dignified pension or to have access to uh, health care through Social Security. So, so we have an issue here with uh, rights and Healthcare. In this sense, we have made efforts in Latin America to progress in these issues and something that we're doing from certain Latin American countries, especially the feminist movement in Latin America. We are encouraging that care work are recognized as one of the pillars of social security of the state, just as education, health care, and also, as it was mentioned by Ana Teresa, Colombia is a, the country in Latin America who has worked most on it regarding a health care system in the country, and it has inspired other Latin American countries so that they can adapt it to their own reality. In the case of Mexico specifically, from several years now, we have been progressing in certain punctual aspects. For example, we have recognized um, the care as a constitutional right in uh, Mexico City. And so the government of Mexico City needs to establish a health care system and also at a national level we have the design of a national strategy on health care and both systems, both locally and nationally, look for the articulation of the demand of care for those people who need it, for children, disabled people, elderly people, and with a strong component, which is to reverse the stereotypes that are put upon women regarding care work. Mexico has had several debates regarding this issue, and a question that I would like to share with you uh, that was stated in one of those debates is that in this design of public policy regarding care work, we have asked ourselves when is the state demanded to provide this type of activities or when does the government need to be a facilitator so that the private sector can also contribute to uh, covering health care. 
So we have progressed and we had a big expectation with the new administration. As you know, um, we changed administrations less than a year ago, and contrary to what we expected, we have been appalled by how the administration has tackled certain issues. We used to have a social program in Mexico for um, parents that would go on leave. So it was a program target to parents who didn't have... So it was a, pro, a social program only focused on um, informal work for parents who wanted to take um, their babies to these care spaces. So when we have the new administration, they cut the budget at 50 percent of this budget for this program and they closed over 3,000 spaces for children especially in the poorest municipalities and even rural municipalities of the country and what changed is that instead of the government who that supports this space they are doing cash transfers or financial transfers so they're giving the money directly to the moms and dads and so the family has now the freedom to to choose with whom they want to leave their children because they receive the money so at first we saw a change in the situation and we saw that some families prefer to keep the money instead of paying for a uh, for the nursery or daycare school so we see grandmothers taking care of the children again and there has been certain controversies from civil society organizations and other political actors and the human rights commission so over the previous months they have said that this action has been regressive and it violates certain rights and they're not really beneficiarying, benefiting the, the people that they created the program for. So we're hoping to redesign this policy. What we hope from uh, Mexico's government, who is committed to the left wing, is to find a way to strengthen the state's institutions so that they can provide care as a foundation so that we can defamilize and defeminize care work by opening new social care work spaces and this would benefit the, pop the whole population, especially women who are the um, highest health care providers as well as um, people who need care. So that's all for my part. Thank you very much. Please, thank you very much for sharing your, your experience and Mexico's experience. The questions you made regarding when does the state has to provide these, um, this care or when does the state need to generate uh, mechanisms so that all care needs are covered. So thank you for asking these questions that will help us advancing and reflecting on the analysis. Let's now move on with Soledad Antonio. Soledad Antonio is from Argentina and she will share with us Argentina's experience. She works for the Social Security Union and she was recently elected as deputy in Buenos Aires. So congratulations, Soledad. 
And let me just ask you a couple of questions so that you can share your thoughts with us. First of all, access to social security and public services regarding health care is crucial for women and for all people who carry out unpaid care work. What is the current reality regarding this? How does austerity measures have impacted both things, the provision of public, ser public health care services in your country? You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I work with the union, as it was said, and we had the possibility to carry out a program that was very successful. So that we can barely hear you, could you speak louder or get closer to your microphone, please? Can you hear me now? Okay, this is much better. So let me start again. As Viviana said, I work for the union and I work with a women's worker. And we opposed with Macri's government when they tried to make this adjustment, which is non, we don't call it austerity, but an adjustment. And uh, on Sunday, the Argentinian population voted, and Argentinian society had a glory moment with uh, Cristina's administration, and we were able to give social security to most of the population. These are public funds. And we created the Sustainability Guarantee Fund in Argentina that allowed us to provide rights for mothers who were doing care work. Also, through provisional inclusion, we were able to add 2.5 million women to this program. And, you know, when they turn 60, they can get their pension, they can retire, and they get a mor moratorium. So they now have access to this moratorium, which uh, all former workers have, and they also gave uh, a political right to the women on pension if they have uh, 30 years working. And I think women in Argentina and Latin America, only 14% of women can really cover the 30 years. Other women, informal workers and even formal workers, they always have to leave work to take care of the family. So the right for women to have access to a pension and a dignified retirement is just acknowledging the fact that the women are taking care of a family, so it needs to be remunerated. We also created other programs regarding social justice uh, which was, uh, we had to do with education, and we provided the students with 
computers so that we can decrease the gap and they could have access to internet and these were for uh, most uh, vulnerable communities and we also give the possibility to these students finishing secondary school to keep studying through another program and the families through the social security could have access to a household or to buy a household. So since 2015, all of those programs um, ended because we had a change in administration. So we stopped paying for those uh, programs and what happened to the moratoriums of the women. They are still struggling because the moratorium would end on July 3rd by law. And so the union workers got together with other social organizations, other international organizations to do a public demonstration and to ask for the president to delay the moratorium so that women can keep have access to the moratorium until 2022. But we had to structurally modify other situations. And that's why we presented a, a project of law, but it's very difficult uh, with this type of administration to, to care for certain sectors of the population. So the struggle we're still fighting has to do with the historic reparation regarding health care. And so this history made that some women did not cover the years to get the moratorium. So women have to retire at 65 with a pension that is very low. Of course, uh, we are against that, and those were the clauses that the IMF has set, and uh, our President Macri uh, started complying with that, but then we realized that not all measures were as positive as they said. So Social Security and acknowledging women's work has made that because they cannot act, have access to formal work with eight hours work a day because they have to take care of their family, they cannot enter the union or political participation of the day-to-day -day life. So the struggle of union feminist, feminism, because the, the, the women here are very feminist, we still work so that we have more women in the workplace, in decision-making positions, both in the political scope, in the union scope, and social, culture, and we really want society to understand that women are prepared to be in those positions and that once we're there, we can make effective the access to all rights. So we need uh, women to do that. Right now, we are facing a new change in government, and it's very hopeful. It will start in, on December 10th, 2019 in which we know that the first measures that this new government will take will be to, to have a real provisional plan to put back in place the moratorium because half a million women still do not have a dignified retirement, so our struggle is still going strong so that more women could have right access to this right, and especially in uh, care work, we work with the unions of 
domestic workers and other colleagues who are in the Congress, who are also in the union. And starting December 10th, we'll have even more quorum. And we are working on a health care law that will be recognized by the government and that will be taken into account by the Ministry of uh, Work, which is uh, another aspect that the neoliberalistic government stops. So we are very hopeful for the future and we want this law to be recognized by the government and we were uh, we had 12 years of uh, work and we did a great um, work with the previous administration. So now we are very hopeful with this new change, this new um, administration regarding social justice. Social justice is very important to guarantee the rights for both men and women. That's all for my part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Soledad, for sharing with us the impacts that structural adjustment policies create, and especially regarding care work. And thank you for sharing how women leadership in Argentina has been very important to make this issue visible and to fight on behalf of women so that they can have uh, access to these services and to social security. Continuing with the Argentinian case, I would like to invite Julieta Escuria to take the floor. She is a lawyer from uh, the University of Rio Plata. She currently works in the economic, social, cultural rights of civil society fighting for equality, so welcome, Julieta. I wanted to ask you how the austerity measures are linked to health care and contracting health care services, and also what are the impacts regarding social security access and um, informal workers. And also, if you could start talking about the key obligations that governments have regarding unpaid care work and social security facing austerity measures in times of crisis. So, Julieta, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Viviana. If there's a problem with the audio, please let me know in the chat box. So welcome everyone. Thank you for inviting me here today. And I would like to start stating certain uh, facts. So first of all, the value of, non of unpaid work in in Latin America is half of the GDP of the country and the crisis of uh, care work precedes a financial and economic crisis, of course, because it has this structural and cultural aspect. So we had some cuts in uh, public expenses, the privatization of certain companies in Argentina and other Latin American countries. And that's why we say that the crisis in academic terms has a differentiated impact in gender. Regarding Argentina specifically, as Soledad mentioned, we have had uh, some progress uh, stratifying care work according to, to money and ge geography. We always prioritize the worker women, the worker mother in formal work, and 
we don't have a comprehensive care system to reverse this inequality situation that affects women mostly. On the other hand, we have an educational system that offers education for the urban areas, basically, because we have a, a private education and from zero to 45 days old and uh, babies can can be taken to daycare. And this has a an impact in the economic sectors who have not enough money to pay to pay for that daycare. So the offer we have at a public level is not enough to cover all the needs of the sectors. Last uh, official news in Argentina, only 30% of boys and girls can have access to these basic needs and we also have uh, the private offer. On the other hand, we have a transfer system with Social Security, which is not very equally distributed. And we have a universal security, Social Security service, but it's still not enough to cover the basic levels for society. And we have several restrictions. For example, only five people per family can do it and other types of uh, transfer systems don't have these limitations. We also have social programs that reduce these um, services to social care, but they, they have a very existentialist um, view. And as our colleague from South Africa said, we saw um, they use the budget for other things. They don't use it for what they say. Um, they have planned to, and many sectors such as the care, healthcare sector has been, has been affected. Um, we have seen how they plan de and they design, but they don't carry out the true program. So in practice, the budget shows that these programs have not been carried out. We have even had strategic litigations with women organizations so that we can reverse the allocation and implementation of the budget because our national law establishes um, the prioritizing of providing health care and education, but these budgets have been um, cut down. So this is a sort of the political map in Argentina. We've had interruptions in pensions for people with uh, disabilities, and this was very important and had a huge impact regarding health care, and it affected uh, women and people with disabilities. Over 60,000 people suffered a cut in their pensions due to the application of a decree that was uh, constitutionally questionable. So it's a huge challenge because um, society imposes certain criteria that are still not taken into account in this decree. We also have a national law that assigns uh, families and that made the transfer program more equally. From 2015 to 2016, we had a cutback in our GDP, although we have had progress in transparency and uh, direct and indirect expenses, as well as uh, gender budgets. However, this does not translate into a better implementation. We need to be aware that international standards establish these adjustments, so we need to look for alternatives as well. We need to assess and evaluate the alternatives to see who are the, who are the people most affected and how they have a direct impact in the rights of women. 
as our Ana Teresa, Chris, and other colleagues have mentioned, social security is very important and has had an uh, impact also weak economic measures. This implies a subordination in the decision-making process within the households. The use of time, the decrease in the quality of life, access and control of their financial resources, gender inequality goes hand in hand with violence, restricted health care services, access to justice. And this brings a lot of social costs. First of all, regarding public budgets and in long term, we've seen that they always delay the implementation of comprehensive public policies regarding health care. They're cutting back on social expenses as well. And this means that we need to um, persist. We see a lot of discrimination regarding gender in the workplace and this has impacts in the quality of life and access of uh, other social rights. And this also translates into a low educational performance. Regarding the second question you made, Viviana, just to state certain laws that regulate the states in uh, healthcare policies establishes that in order to avoid discrimination against women and to provide them the right to work, we have to establish adequate measures to, to support parents and families in general by combining their family obligations and their work obligations. This is done through a network for health care, specifically for children, and in Recommendation 28, a good practice would be that strategic actors on this could get the resources they need to reach their goals. When we had the Quito consensus, all states voted to work on economic, social, and cultural rights as a economic objective and social responsibility. Just to mention a few other standards, at the International Work Conference in 2012, we established the need to regulate and implement social security health care for people and the goal 5.4 of the ODGs, which regards um, gender, we need to recognize and acknowledge the informal work through social services, infrastructure, and promoting the shared responsibility of the family. So these are commitments that the state has uh, engaged with, but we still have many challenges to, to face. The Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Organization in Argentina and other states want to reinforce public policies with a assigned budget and to strengthen and extend a comprehensive health care social service because as we see in Argentina and in the rest of Latin America there's a huge discrimination regarding territory and also regarding social conditions, which are intersectorial issues. We talked about a, a plan for men and women who link the health care without guaranteeing those who have formal work, but also for all workers in general. Regarding the austerity measures, the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Committee, the Children's Committee, the Inter-American Commission have 
strengthen the standard or the principles that apply to social security. And although this has been a way the states found an exit to justify the non-compliance with some obligations, so now we are strengthening um, the ESCR Commission, and we have decided that when we have these uh, austerity measures, the government have to take the lesser ones, so they have budgetary uh, tax and international cooperation policies, and they have to vote for those who are non-discriminatory, both explicitly and implicitly. And I mentioned this because some of the budgets that are planned we see that uh, they cut the budget and they're not explicit, but we can see it in the numbers, so that's why discrimination can be implicit. When we see that they allocate more budgets to programs that are, for example, official publicity or state publicity, and they don't allocate enough budget for other types of programs. So they also want to justify the measures by complying with um, by giving the resources. So committees here have highlighted the retribution alternatives with a more just tax policy. So we have many tools regarding uh, taxation and, and budget and in the whole tax policy in general. We have interesting recommendations in that sense. And also the states have to carry out the due time and due manner of these measures. They cannot, um, they always have to justify and have access to, uh, will give access at the minimum rate and also to guarantee the participation of uh, affected groups for these alternatives. I think I've gone over time, but just to wrap up, I would like to highlight uh, the fact of uh, our discriminatory principle has to do with the four criteria I mentioned, but we need to remember that these austerity measures or adjustment measures have to take into account the guarantee of social and cultural rights is not guaranteed by the budget. It's not an implicit right, but Rather, the legislation is done indirectly for public policy, and it's important here to, for the social, for the civil society to make visible these issues. We also have indicators that impact, uh, that show the impact of discrimination in women, and we also need to, to make sure that the states ha adopt positive actions, positive politics, for example, to allocate more budget to a comprehensive health care system rather than all other policies that are prior, prioritized. That way we can uh, end with the positive discrimination and differential factors. Thank you, Julieta. What you mentioned is very interesting especially regarding the ESCR standards and what is happening in the Argentinian context, how these austerity measures have had an impact in social services, healthcare services, and how they have a high social cost. It creates uh, more conditions for poverty. So. With this, I would like to link it with our last speaker of the call. Who is 
who works at CSR New York. This is an international human rights organization. Kate works with um, issues regarding austerity, women's rights, the Agenda 2030. She was previously an advisor for uh, the UN Rapporteur of Extreme Poverty and Human Rights but she specializes in unpaid care work and tax policy. So Kate, we're very pleased to have you here today in this call. First of all, let me ask you about the link between poverty and lack of social security access for women in unpaid care work and also the link between uh, financing care and contracting social care services and how austerity is linked to financing care work. And I would also ask you to, to answer what Julieta was answering, which is what are the most important obligations that states have regarding unpaid care work and access to social security in relation to austerity measures. Kate, you have the floor. Um, I'm gonna assume that you can hear me if, uh, if I don't hear otherwise. And yeah, Viviana, please, if I'm talking too fast for the interpreters, please let me know because I have a tendency to talk very fast. Um, so yeah, the good thing about going last is that most things have already been said. So I'm gonna try and not repeat what other people have said because I think we have a really rich picture from the other presentations um, about how concretely how unpaid care work is impacting women's rights and women's poverty um, in different contexts. So I'm kind of coming from a, I'll try and give maybe a more global perspective about some of the global trends that we're seeing. Um, because yeah, I mean, CSR where I work is an international human rights organization. We work in a number of different countries uh, with partners there, including some of the organizations that are represented here. Um, so, and we've been working for a number of years on the impact of austerity measures on human rights, um, including on women's human rights. Um, so. Uh, for example, we've documented the impact of austerity measures with our national partners in countries like Egypt, South Africa, Spain, Ireland, Brazil, and hopefully that list gives gives you the sense already that austerity really is like a, is a, it's a global trend. Like austerity is the norm. Um, uh, in fact, there's a, a new report written by Isabel Ortiz and Matthew Cummins about um, like scanning the trends in austerity around the world, and the report is called the new normal. Um, more country, like, there's something like nearly 150 countries now have some form of austerity measures in place. So it's really not an isolated incident, and the kind of impacts and the kind of policies that we've heard about from the other speakers in specific countries are happening all around the world in low-income countries, in middle-income countries, in high-income countries. Um, so it really is a global phenomenon. Um, so yeah, so as we've heard, um, uh, unpaid care work has major impacts on women's human, human rights, on a number of their human rights, their access to social security being one of them, um, but also their right to work, their right to decent work in particular, um, their right to health, their right to education. Um, and what we've found and what the research of others has, has found is that austerity really exacerbates um, these impacts. And this is because austerity measures, you know, the, as we've got a sense from the other speakers, austerity measures are kind of a package of different policy measures, but all with like essentially the same logic of kind of cutting the size of the state. Um, so austerity measures, as we've heard, you know, typically involve things like cuts to social spending, which means diminished public services, uh, regressive taxation reforms, um, and also cuts to the public sector wage bill. And of course, all of these things impact on women and their unpaid care work in particular ways. Cuts to social spending, or spending, for example, on public services, 
um, have a major impact because they essentially push the burden of care work onto the home onto uh, and usually on onto women in the home um, so you know it's not that you know when you cut health services or care services it's not that suddenly that care doesn't need to be done and still needs to be done by someone the just burden is being is being moved from the public to the private essentially and onto onto the backs of women so these policies basically assume that women's time is elastic so it creates a much greater time burden for women. Um, regressive taxation reforms, we heard a bit about um, increase in VAT. Um, we, we heard a bit about uh, increases in VAT in South Africa, for example. So these regressive tax reforms both kind of compound the problem of the, of the limited resources of the state and impact the impact, impact the incomes of the poor and especially of women in particular. Um, and then cuts to the public sector wage bill push women out of formal employment in the public sector. The public sector is a major employer of women in many contexts um, and kind of push them into more informal and unpredictable forms of labour, which then has detrimental impacts on their burden of unpaid care work at home. And so it then becomes a vicious circle. So there's kind of the austerity measures, kind of each kind of component of austerity measures has this kind of very detrimental impact on women's unpaid care work, which is basically invisibilised. Like no one, policymakers don't think about it um, before they do it. Um, and I just wanted to say something quick about the kind of uh, Viviana's question. Kind of hinted at these other trends, which I think are really important to consider, and they very much intersect with with austerity, which are these trends of of um, the financialization financial sorry I can't speak the financialization of care. Um, and the contraction of public and affordable care services, and these are really converging trends, and especially the kind of financialization, the trend toward financialization and privatization is very linked to austerity because governments think it will save them money. Um, but essentially, what it means is it makes care a, a something that only has a profit motive. So, of course, it squeezes the services available. Paid care workers get paid less, and more of the care gets pushed onto the household once again, because private providers don't have the incentive to, to provide quality services um, to people who can't afford to pay or can't afford to pay very much. So we're seeing these kind of these link trends, and we're also seeing that the increasing link of Social Security just to, just to work. So the contributory, contributory Social Security systems are really important, but from a human rights perspective, they can't be the only form of Social Security system we have, because people who don't work in remunerated form need also to have social security but we're increasingly seeing social security being um, only linked to employment or having very um, difficult conditions placed on it um, so that's a um, so that's a problematic trend for women and their unpaid care work i'll very quickly um talk about um the second question, Julieta covered perfectly, um, very quickly and very comprehensively, um, all the the key obligations that states have. So I'm not going to spend more time talking about it. But what I will talk about is like why I think it's important to have those the, those human rights obligations in mind, and why it's important, why human rights are important in this debate, and why we should have, we should be citing those norms and obligations. Um, like, for example, you know, the obligations to do human rights impact assessments and the obligation of maximum available resources, which I think, you know, it's important to remember when we talk about maximum available resources, um, it's not just about expenditure. We also need to be talking about tax policy because it's the obligation of the state to raise in equitable, progressive ways the amount of money that is needed to, to realise human rights. Um, so I think that's important to bear in mind. but. Yeah, just to close by saying that I think that, that the reason why human rights is important um, to kind of consider in these debates and is because I think it can be an effective kind of effective tool to counter some of the double speak and the cooperation we're seeing um, we're seeing around unpaid care work um, and especially the kind of so called solutions um, that are being promoted by neoliberal governments and neoliberal international financial institutions um, uh, in particular so for example you know we are seeing um, more um, kind of big institutions at the global and national level talk about unpaid care work um, you know unpaid care work is in the SDGs now in the sustainable development goals um, we're seeing more and more um, institutions and, and politicians at Davos for example talk about women's economic empowerment 
Um, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, just published a uh, report on unpaid care work and, for example, has introduced kind of some conditions in its loan programs um, around funding for public nurseries. So I think we really need these like human rights obligations and these human rights tools to really be able to pinpoint, okay, these, are, these things are not actually solutions. The solutions we need are much bigger and more holistic and more structural. You know, we can't be talking about, oh, um, increasing women's labor force participation if we're ignoring actually the structural obstacles that are, that are, that are making it difficult for women to enter the labor force. And especially, you know, women's, increasing women's labor force participation isn't a solution at all if you're just pushing them into badly paid informal jobs and they still have the double shift of the vast burden of unpaid care work in the home. And another, another kind of policy trend which uh, others have cited as well is this trend towards, uh, I think it was Chris, this trend towards conditionality in social security. So conditional cash transfer programs are, are a huge trend. The World Bank pushes them. Many governments have pushed them. Um, but actually, they end up increasing women's unpaid care work and reinforcing this vicious cycle. So I think being able to have these, these human rights standards and obligations um, in mind, I think, is really important to kind of counter some of those so-called solutions that are, that are out there and promoted promoted by governments and, and, and international institutions. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you, everyone. Gracias, Kate, por tu intervención y gracias también por ayudar a... Thank you, Kate, for your presentation and thank you for giving a more global view on these trends that are impacting the unjust social distribution. And so this is the end of our presentations and we have a couple of minutes for uh, questions. So if you want to write your question down in the chat box, please do so. Or if you want to take the floor, click on the hand symbol. I just would like to make a final remark regarding uh, Mexico and Argentina and also what Kate said. I think it's interesting to see how in some of our countries we have mentioned the non-contributive pensions, which are a way of acknowledging uh, care work, which are um, conditional transfer of women who provide care or people with disabilities or pensions per child. So we see how these pensions, how these um, money transfer are part of a, a policy that acknowledges care, but it does not solve or distribute the overload of care work that um, comes to women. So it does not diversify the options that women or workers have. And I think it's important to make visible the debates we have with the government and the dialogue if they're going to keep uh, implementing these type of transfer or if they're going to to change it. Thank you, Chris, for your comments. Would someone like to react or ask a question or have a final comment? Okay, well, I think we can wrap up. Thank you so much for all the speakers for this great discussion. Chris, thank you for being online uh, in Mexico. It's very early, so thank you. And hopefully we can keep uh, talking about this as a collective. So, second of all, we invite you to join our global campaign, which is a, a global women's strike 
which is on March 8th of next year, to show the world what happens if uh, women go on strike, the world will stop. So you have the link of the campaign on the chat box, and hopefully you can join this collective effort. Our next um, discussion will be on violence and harassment in work. According to the IOS 170 convention, so we will have um, a call soon, so thank you everyone, hope you have a great day.